As Whitney Houston said, I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Today, we have with us an energetic clinical psychologist working in for the welfare of kids, had been practicing clinical psychology in national health service and states of Jersey. He has worked on a research psychologist at the Institute of Psychiatry London and Institute of Child Health and also Great Ormond Street in London. He has a great experience in psychological assessment of children, young people and adults for the purpose of understanding their developmental and psychological well-being. He is the director and consultant at Spencer Education Limited. He's extremely passionate about his work, which made him come up with a web-based psychometric test to address the mental health of students, Spencer.education. Help me in welcoming Dr. Brian Williams from London. First of all, thank you, Dr. Brian, to take our time to inspire and be the hero of our kids by sharing your experiences, observations, and learnings from the struggles. Welcome to Life's Book Skype interview, Dr. Brian. Thank you very much. Good morning to you. <laughs> all right. Good morning. Good morning. All right, Dr. Brian. So we are interested to know your experiences, your background, about your childhood, what kind of struggles you have been, what helped you to move from that low selves to the higher selves. Just share about your childhood a bit. Wow. Yes, I'm very happy to. You can't see this because I'm sitting down. But one of the things that characterizes me is that I'm a short man. I'm five foot three, one, right. 161 centimeters. <laughs> and um, I, I was always very small in school. Now, the reason this is important is because I I knew from a very young age that I was never going to be a basketball player in America. Mm. And that um, I didn't I didn't have a kind of brain that made learning very easy. It was a struggle. I could sing and I could play musical instruments, but not as well as some children. Mm -hmm. um, but. I think my height made me a bit insecure. Um, anyway, so years later, as the years went on, what I have realized and I've used in my my life and my professional work is that whenever all, when we all have something we don't like with the wrong gender, with the wrong color, with the wrong height, with the wrong size, we've got the wrong eyes, we've got the wrong nose that we we think that this defines us but actually it makes me realize that whatever we are we all have something uniquely special about us and um <clears throat> in my job as a psychologist one of the things that bothers me is that there is a there is a an image that we have to follow so i mean for example um you must forgive me if this is slightly naive but when i'm on the plane traveling from london to dubai and, I'm watching the videos and they have the, uh, the this tremendous Indian industry and film culture. And it's like this beautiful man, he's tall, the woman, she's beautiful, she's she's elegant, her clothes are beautiful. And I'm thinking, gosh, everybody must be wanting to be like these people. Everyone wants to be in a movie with them, just like over here or in Hollywood. And actually, do you know what? They might be beautiful, but we also all have something special about us. And my height has actually turned out to be a great resource to me. It has allowed me to uh, find confidence in myself. Um, people cherish me for who I am. And, and I think one of the messages I want to give all sorts of people, and particularly children and young people, is to celebrate not only who they are, but also celebrate what other people are, irrespective of whether they belong in an Indian film or whether they are just who they are, whether they're short or fat or not very bright or they're good at music or not good at music or good at football or cricket or let's not go into cricket because we'll start upsetting each other. But um, yeah, so that that's really important to me that we celebrate each person for what they're good at. 
Absolutely, absolutely. The wonderful part is that you are sharing your vulnerabilities, which is important for kids to know. We at times don't share with our kids that we also make mistakes, that we are also at fault and we also face failures. They must, they need to know that we also face failures. We also had our vulnerabilities, but we overcome them and see today you are successful. So please. Because, because I knew, I knew that I could study. I knew that I could write and I didn't need to be tall or handsome or in a movie to be able to do that. So I was able to study and to do well in my studies and get a good degree and become a doctor of psychology. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's what makes me strong. And I'd love to give back with that. Yeah, that's that's your belief in you. That's yeah. just wonderful. Yeah. However, so when you saw other kids and peers, uh, did they taunt you on your short height or other stuff? Have, have Had you been bullied in your school times or in your college times? I don't think I'd call it bullied. Um, but I think children can be very cruel to each other. Yeah. And I probably may even be that myself that I would have said that somebody was too tall or they were too fat or that they were, uh, you know, I mean, for example, Indian children growing up in England, a lot of them, they weren't necessarily bullied, but their their color of their skin as Indian, Indian children, British Indian children and Pakistani uh, children, they, 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 they were picked on. And, um, and it wasn't necessarily it wasn't necessarily deliberate bullying, but you always felt like it was an issue. I'm mm-hmm. just using that to help young people in India understand what it was like f- for British Indian children. Um, but I, I think that it, it, the, the really important thing for me in it is that because I found something that I was good at, I was very, very lucky that my parents and my friends and my teachers and the people that run the choir and the people that did the sports they celebrated what I was good at. Mm-hmm. So the message to mum and dad, to to aunt and uncle, to grandma, who are very powerful in your country, grandmas, yeah. um, <laughs> and to teachers, um, is, uh, we, you know, whatever your child is doing, then you celebrate it. Mm-hmm. You know, you celebrate that they're short or they're tall or, or they're good at music or they're good at sport. And when somebody says they want to be a tattoo artist, mm-hmm. then... Yeah, expect them to be able to read and write, but also celebrate what they want to do with them. If they don't want to be an academic, they want to be uh, an engineer with cars, then celebrate it with them. Because we, we, we all we all have a place in the world and we have the right for people to tell us that it's OK for us to be ourselves. Mm-hmm. Right. Wonderfully said. Wonderfully said. All no, right. I, I, would, I would. Can I throw this? This is the clin- clinician, the clinical psychologist talking. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes there will be children, for example, um, who, uh, I mean, I'm very aware over here looking at the Indian media about issues around respect for other people's bodies and how to treat people in terms of sexuality. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, for young people coming to terms with their sexual identity, these are not big things that will get talked about at home in India, just like they're not in England. All um, right. But but so some of those things are very hard for for children to be able to say, actually, I do need to discuss who I am. But again, you know, there are ways of finding safe people at school and in the community in faith places to to explore you are. So, you know, I, I'm horrified to hear that uh, one young person an hour is committing suicide in India. Yeah. This is devastating news, devastating. And, um, you, you know, clearly we all want to do something to try to try and reverse that. So talking to people is so important. Absolutely. With this new generation, digital uh, media and, you know, even studies going on digitally, of course, this communication is something which which our kids are lacking. All right. So yeah. this primarily is a question from a clinical psychologist. If I am a student at, in school at college and I am being not treated well by my peers, I am being always left alone. What can I do for myself? What kind of self-talk can I follow? Or what actions, what what three actions which I can take on daily basis which would help me um, raise my self-esteem in my eyes? Well, there there are two things I would say. Um, The first is quite a bigger picture. And I want to tell you about it because I think it's something that India has given the world 
and certainly given me that's very special. And that is a lot of my work uh, with children and young people and families and schools is, is driven by the philosophy of Gandhi. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mahatma that, Gandhi. Um, yes, that, that I, I use the principles of nonviolent resistance. Mm -hmm. So the line I take with bullying and harassment and sexual crimes are, I have no tolerance for those things happening. And I think for children to feel safe at school and to feel safe within their families, there needs to be a cultural, every one of us, just like Gandhi said, we will not tolerate this anymore. Mm -hmm. We will not. And there's a lot of people in India, I can see in the media, are standing up to sexual crimes and victimization and saying, no, no more, no mm -hmm. more. And doing things that um, a, a school should be a very safe place. And I think it's in contingent on the children to know that their teachers and their parents uh, have ha got Gandhi standing with them when they go to school in the morning saying, there is no place here for 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 bullying and violence of that kind. Right. So that that that's been very powerful. Now, I, I think if children know that they're in a culture where they're going to be heard, the 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 most important thing I think is for children to recognise that there are people who are in pain, and sometimes they're distressed because they're seeing violence at home, or they're 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 experiencing something like a loss of a parent or something like this. Um, that they they can take out their distress by hurting other people. Mm -hmm. And so we need to approach the bully with some degree of empathy, but at the same time making it clear it's not possible. So if you like, I'm really sorry you're having a bad time, but there is no way you can hurt somebody else. Right. And that's why it's why it is, I, I wish I could convey it more strongly to you. It must be okay for every child that you work with, that you come across, that watches what we're talking about, to understand they must talk about being bullied. Mm -hmm. They have to find somebody. Right. And we have to listen to them and we have to respond to them. Mm -hmm. We can talk about all sorts of strategies for managing bullying, but if we don't get that right, we're going nowhere. Right, yeah? right. Now, I'm, I'm also, can I also just say one other point about sure. it that I think is interesting? Mm -hmm is that people ask me a lot of time, is this really bullying? Is this mm -hmm. bullying? Or is it just sort of like somebody criticising me socially? And I mm -hmm. think the flip side to this that we need to be careful of, and I'm not, I'm not for a minute saying bullying isn't the most hideous thing on the planet. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. um, and that is that we also need to build our resilience. And when people do criticise us for being late, or they criticise us for not putting effort into our homework, or they tell us that we're not good at football. We're not all good at everything all the time, every time. And the pressure to be perfect in your culture and my culture is huge. Mm -hmm. But actually, one of the things we've also got to do with bullying is help people be more resilient. And mm -hmm. so, so learning strategies for telling people, no, you cannot hurt me. I accept that I've done that wrong or I accept that this isn't right, but you don't have the right to hurt me. But that doesn't mean you have the right to... Um, uh, to to hide behind a, a stress um, and and become all consumed by it. It's a major concern for me that young people don't feel they don't feel very resilient anymore, and that worries me. Mm -hmm. Right, indeed, very beautifully said, very beautifully said. All right. So, what are the three life skills you believe should be mandatory for all the kids, being that? preached at home or being that mentored at schools? Yes, Three right. Well, I mean, I've, I've already sort of introduced you to one. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, it is again, I think it's good for young people in India to know what influence your philosophy is having in the West. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I would repeat that mindfulness, um, being at peace with who you are, accepting who you are, being proud of who you are, whatever you are, however short you are, Mm -hmm. uh, however gay you might be, whatever it is the young person's struggling yes. with, that that they they uh, they find peace in themselves and they make that their priority. Not the number of hits they get on social media, how many people like mm -hmm. them, how good they look in their video. That that to me is not important. What you've got to focus on is is that you feel good inside, and and your goodness does not come from somebody liking a picture of you on the screen. Mm -hmm. So I, I I would say that's very important. I would I would also say that I think that we are we are all faced with challenges 
I mean, no more so than young people in India with education. Goodness me, the demands on you are huge. And um, to know that every day isn't always a brilliant, exciting opportunity. These are the, emotion, the emotions of sadness, the emotions of fear, the emotions of disappointment, of loss. These are normal human emotions alongside excitement, success, pride. And I, and I think young people would, would benefit from knowing that these are normal. It's not abnormal to feel a bit sad. It's mm-hmm. when you're supposed to. It's not abnormal to be angry. What's abnormal is to display that anger through violence. Right. So that, that would be my second thing. Um, and and I, th- I think the other thing, too, is that um, we value, if we want to be valued as people ourselves, then we need to start by showing that we value other people so that we don't pick on people because of their height or because mm-hmm. of their gender or, or because they aren't as bright as you. And that we do genuinely, our integrity comes from being kind to other people. And what I found in my life, and I'm sure you feel the same, mm-hmm. when I give to people, I get, if I give 10% back, give 10%, I get 3,000% back. Absolutely. Yeah. So I've been through some recent crises in my life, and I have been totally overwhelmed by the generosity of my family and friends. And and I say to them, why? And they say, because you give. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not a payback. It's just that they want to care and love for me. And so I think each and every person that might watch this video and listen to our conversation needs to hear that it's we, it, they're not going to give it to us. We've got to give it to them first. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Very, very rightly said. And I have, we have been interviewing different principals, different successful people. And this is the most important thing. The more we give is the more we get. And yes. I believe that one of the purpose of our lives is to give to the society as much as possible and nobody keeps anything. It just comes back very beautifully. And as you mentioned, 10% of what we give, we get 3000% back. And this is absolutely right. This is also one of the success mantras, which one person successful people are also following. This is giving without expecting anything and what you return back is everything keeps running after you yes. that's just wonderful wonderful uh, what are three daily motivations for you to get into action so maybe morning rituals which you are following which inspires you or motivate you to get start with your day i think it's got easier as i've got older <laughs> because I'm, okay. I'm a very old man now i'm 54 this year mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're um, just 14. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just um, 11 in that case. <laughs> yes. But inside, inside, I'm more like a seven year old child. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. So yesterday I was playing with dinosaurs and um, a, a Lego rocket that a boy mm-hmm. of five had been given for Christmas. So I had a great day. Mm-hmm. Um, but actually, to, to answer your question, I think I think what I'm learning is so important and I wish I knew this when I was a younger person that I really value each day mm-hmm. so I'm not you know and that that's hard when you're you know I've got things I'm trying to do in business or you know developing things I'm looking to the future of course I am but actually today you know when I'm eating my breakfast or when I'm going to go to work later on or whatever I'm doing even just enjoying being here with you right now and I think to stop chasing the latest video stop chasing the latest like um, mm-hmm. is, is very motivating to me. So I enjoy walking now. Um, I enjoy being with people, just being with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I think the other thing is that I would, I'd, I'd like to think that I am motivated to look after my body better. Mm-hmm. Because I, th- I think that um, with sleep, I mean, I'm terrible. Like, for example, I'll check my emails if I wake up in the night. What, mm-hmm. Why am I doing that? So I'm, I'm trying to teach myself that I know that looking at my phone screen in the night stops the sleep hormones in my brain from working and therefore I stay awake and therefore I feel tired the next morning. So I'm trying to live more healthily, eat more healthy um, and uh, yeah, take take better care of the body that is is here. Focusing on my mind and my body in equal measure probably. Um, and I think the other thing is that I'd like to make sure that I've uh, the people around me that I cherish 
my children, my my parents, my my sisters, my brother, um, that I like to think of them and know that they're well. Um, and uh, you know, to to empower my friends to feel okay and that they can come to me if they need to, and that I can go to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And nice. in my work, I just had one little extra, if I may have a fourth one. In my work, and I, I give this as a message, really, is that I spent a lot of my time working with children who have been harmed by violence or sexual abuse or emotional mm -hmm. harm. And I think that we think that always happens to somebody down the corridor. It's not in our lives. But if it is in our lives, it's wrong. And people cannot hurt you and will not hurt you and should not hurt you. And, and that's why... In your culture, in our culture, people say, no, that's not right. And, and I really hope people th from my work feel empowered to be able to say, you can't hurt me. You, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be resilient and I'm, I'm going to cope with my life, but you can't hurt me. So that, that's a really important part of my life, protecting people from harm. Mm -hmm. So this is the time when kids need to stand for themselves and say, stop it. You're not going to treat me ill. Right. Completely. This is the time. Yeah. yeah, but right. but absolutely completely true. No child in India deserves to be hit violently, mm. to be sexually harmed, to be ignored, to be emotionally ignored, to just be given a phone and then sent to your bedroom and ignored for hours on end. Parents need to play with their children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there was, a, there was a there was a lady on social media at Christmas in England, and it was just before Christmas, and she wrote, "I've got my grandchildren for the day." And I don't know what to do with them. Is there an activity we can go to? And mm -hmm. people were writing, go and see Father Christmas, go and see the reindeers, go and do all these crazy things that people do in over here at Christmas. And I, I was really quite irritated. And I, it's not like me to respond. And I did it respectfully. But I said, I wonder whether reading a Christmas story and making some mince pies, which is a traditional English cake we make for Christmas with mm -hmm. your grandchildren would be uh, fine. They don't need, <laughs> we don't need to be stimulated all the time. Right. Yeah. And and also, though, although I don't want children to be harmed and I want them to be doing normal things, if you like, to, to, to read a book with their grandmother or, you know, to, to just go for a walk in the garden. My goodness me. Um, but but I, I, can I repeat this bit? I'm not saying to you that children should be living in a bubble. The world is hard. Anger, sadness, fear. These things have to be learned to be tolerated. And I don't want to put children in a bubble thinking that they can't cope with stress because you will have to cope with stress. Mm -hmm. And if we don't deal with competition and disappointment and shame when we're young, then we're not going to be able to deal with them when we're adults. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. When, when, we, when our parents die, the most natural thing in the world, if we're not knowing how to deal with our emotions when we're grown up, we've got to learn that when we're children. So I'm not, I'm not going to give you an easy ride as a young person but I'm not going to hurt you and I'm not going to let anybody else hurt you either. It's a balance. As you are coming from clinical psychology and you have observed multiple kids, what do you think is the impact of how we have been treated and what we have gone through in our childhood has an impact on our adulthood and the rest of our lives? Okay. Well, the, the science tells us something very interesting and that, that is what psychology is, is science. We know from a study, for example, of Romanian orphans, this is a place in Europe where children were left in an orphanage very, very young as babies and nobody cared for them. What the research is telling us now, some 30 years on, is that those children's brains were 8 to 10 percent smaller than a normal brain. Now, we've known from studies in America through Bruce Perry and uh, Shaw and others that if we, we don't feed the brain both good nutrition but also stimulation through touch, through communication, through talking, through playing, through eye contact, through touching the nose, by touching the lips. All of these things that you see most Indian mothers and fathers and brothers doing, grandmas, that if you don't do that, then the brain doesn't get nurtured and it literally doesn't uh, make good connections. So that's, that's when you've got nothing happening then the other thing that's really even worse than that no it isn't worse it's as bad and that is when you've got a normal brain but what you do is you keep the the child so frightened that the cortisol the the adrenaline like you're running a race in the school uh, sports day that if the baby is that 
stimulated all the time because around them is fear, there is violence, there is shouting, there is there is a need to try and survive, then that cortisol, if you like, damages the brain. It burns the circuits of the brain and it causes the brain not to develop in the same way. Now, what we understand is if you've got that very young, then yes, of course, things change and there's some plasticity, but it's those first three years of life and certainly those first eight months of life where we're building the foundations to being strong people trusting ourselves, knowing that we are safe in the world. And without that, you know, the people I work with who've had that experience all the way through their lives, they're not safe. Mm. I'm going to see a teenage girl today who's in a terrible state. We're having to put her in a, a locked place where she can't get out because she's she's causing so much harm to herself because early in her life, she was so damaged by people. So it has a massive impact. And the reason why I am uh, I am who I am, and I'm sure most people you know will be the same, is because we had a grandparent, a mother and a father, a sister, an aunt, who loved us and cherished us. And, um, you know, one of the lovely things, I don't know, where, I, I, I've only ever been to India once, and I'd love to come again one day. But what one of the things I, I cherish about my Indian friends over here is that their families are so important. You know, and that the grandmother is there to support them and their and their their aunts and their uncles and they live in big communities, very, very close. Some people say too close and too isolated, but actually their strength comes from being together. Now, there are a lot of Indian children who aren't that fortunate over here, don't get me wrong, but culturally we can hold ourselves together. And that is such a good building block for the future. Mm -hmm. So if you live in Mumbai and you're going to go to university in Delhi and nobody lives in Delhi that you know, you're going to be confronted with being on your own. And that's really challenging when you've been surrounded by your family in Mumbai. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it is essential that you give babies a good start and that you don't harm them and you mm -hmm. feed them, you give them good food. It's not going to be brilliant. It's just got to be enough. Mm -hmm. All right. So one part is feeding them nutrition for their bodies and their brains. However, do you feel that when we talk about growth mindset and positive stuff, this is also something which is important for our brains to feed our brains with positive, powerful stuff, maybe powerful I ams. Do you see that this is also important? You mean in terms of nutrition or do you mean in terms of behavior? In terms of behavior, so here in Indian parents, they are very cautious about what they are feeding their kids primarily yeah. for their bodies. However, yeah. what we ignore is what we need to feed to the brains also, because yes. it's not yes. just the food, but the thoughts also. And we are all made oh up of my goodness. Do you know one of the hardest things? Do you have McDonald's where you are? Do you have the American <laughs> restaurant yes. McDonald's? Yeah. Yes. Oh, my goodness. It, over here, they have these long tables and they have like these iPads and the children can come in the restaurant. Nobody talks mm -hmm. to anybody. They get on these iPads on the desk and they mm -hmm. eat their food. And um, I, I guess what I'm saying is there is a real danger. And I know I've done it myself as a father on an airplane or waiting at an airport that you give your child an iPad to play with. Mm -hmm. But parents have got to put these things down. Mm -hmm. Um, they, they they are tremendous things. We, the technology that young people have today is fantastic and we must use it in every way, particularly in education. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I would, if, if I could give one thing to a parent in India who's having a child is make sure that you spend 20 minutes every day with your child at some point doing something, not taking them somewhere, sitting in a restaurant on an iPad, put your phone down. Mm -hmm. And talk to your child, colour with your child, listen to them read a book, comb their hair, go and kick a ball, paint a wall. I don't care what it is. Mm -hmm. Dig for worms in the garden if you have to. Mm -hmm. But if it, just to feel... It, it, I find it heartbreaking over here to watch so many families just all sitting in the restaurant, all on their mobile phones. Right. Yeah. And I, I think psychologically that's very damaging because we miss into intimacy, we miss chances to communicate. Um, and but I'm not saying it's all wrong. I'm, you're not mm -hmm. you're not hearing me say that, are you? I'm not saying it's all wrong. Mm -hmm. but, but 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 yeah. So read 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 books together, walk together, go and pick. I mean, it sounds romantic, but 
yeah d- d- just just be with a human being as no. well yeah 20 minutes a day that's all i'm asking that's nothing is it uh keeping off all your gadgets completely mm-hmm. and and if there are any young people listening to me maybe 90 minutes an hour and a half before they go to sleep at night the phone needs to be off the mm-hmm. screen needs to be off because unless you're sleeping well you're not growing well your brain isn't growing well that's mm. when it all happens in the night when you're asleep right so, mm-hmm. yeah right what are a couple of things which kids and young people can do immediately before they are going to sleep maybe 20 minutes before they are going to sleep does what we watch what we go through and the kind of thoughts we think during that period immediately before we are going to sleep has got any impact on our brains or the next day well the science will tell us that it's what we as psychologists think about called sleep hygiene and we know that having a good sleep pattern as i've already alluded to is essential particularly in adolescence for growth your growth hormone is secreted when you're asleep at night Mm -hmm. Um, and it's good for restoring the body for letting it rest and it's good for your um, concentration and for your learning it's it's good it, it, it's sleep sleep is as important as breathing mm-hmm. so one of the things we've got to learn as young people and children is to learn to sleep sleep well now some parents would probably say but my child sleeps too well i could never get them up mm-hmm. and there is some evidence that younger people in their teenage years will sleep longer and sleep later and that's challenging but you know they have to, they have to get through that stage of development so recognizing that it's it's really important Sleep hygiene requires you to uh, 20 minutes, but I prefer 90 minutes before, if you can, an hour definitely, to make sure that your brain is having an opportunity to release the hormones that make you feel sleepy. That bit, mm-hmm. yeah? Now, if you if you put the wrong light on your eye, then it stops that happening. Mm-hmm. Um, it can prevent it from happening. And then, of course, you can't get to sleep. Mm-hmm. And then you're tired for school and then you're irritable and you're angry when your father comes to wake you or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, having a routine where your bed, your bed and your bedroom can be a study and can be a social place at certain times of the day. But there are times 90 minutes before it's time to sleep when it becomes a bedroom and a bedroom mm-hmm. is a place where a bed goes and a bed is where we sleep. Mm-hmm. And and so that you 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 do your best to make sure that your child's bed is is good enough and comfortable enough, um, and that it's clean enough, and that the child feels safe in their bed, that you're not fighting downstairs, for example, or in the other room. Mm-hmm. So all of those things are very important. All of them, all every every bit of it, so that you have the chance to go to sleep and to stay to sleep. Mm-hmm. Right. So it is getting ready to sleep before we go to sleep. Yeah. I mean, some some people will want to shower. Some people would prefer to do that in the morning. Some people prefer to do their hair. I, I, I'm not terribly fussy about it. And although uh, although I think, I don't know what the practice is in India, I should imagine that a lot of children will sleep when they're young with their parents. Mm-hmm. I think as long as you've taken every step you can to protect a very young baby from being suffocated, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a normal thing for human animals to sleep with one another. And so yeah. for the younger children to sleep with their parents, it seems quite normal to me. How important do you see power of positive words or positive information and versus negative words and negative information has on kids' mind? Well, I, I, I think the words are how we deliver a message we're trying to convey. But mm-hmm. the thing that's so important is we don't get caught up in the kind of the if you like the technical or the uh, the concreteness of the words, if if I, I can say to children, I believe in you all, you're all very important. I can say that to any child anywhere, but I've got to believe it. I've got to really believe it. And then I've got to follow it up by what I do. Mm-hmm. Because I think you have to hear something cognitively and you have to feel it emotionally and you have to experience it behaviorally. Right. So there's there's no point telling children that I value and I respect you in the tutor group and then going out into the school and humiliating the child in front of other people. Mm-hmm. 
so um those words are very important but the words it's like anything isn't it i i i think it, the word the words are like the the face of it the symbol um mm -hmm. but we've got to experience it that i am valued i am you know i i am short and yet being a short non-sportsman is valued in my school and it was mm -hmm. you know yeah or my, my friend is good at this and i'm not and i value them for that and i let them know that i tell them it but i also show them i come and watch them play football i i go and clap my hands when they get a certificate i mm -hmm. show them as well as tell them that they're doing well and it's very important that we all believe that we're worthwhile we all, we, we, we all have something to give whoever we are however vulnerable whatever it is however i learned that from my father um i t can i tell you a quick story when oh. i was in, in in london in in the hospital at great ormond street there was um a man on the front desk who was in a wheelchair and uh he was uh he he was a, a lovely kind man who i got to know as a, as a friend i mean we we, we we didn't see each other as of work but we were you know we got on well and whenever he needed something i would be there for him mm -hmm. and people said to me in the department how come you always get things done for you mm -hmm. how come you always get you know you get boxes brought up for you and things like this and i kind of looked at them as i said well because because my friends help me like i help them mm -hmm. and they thought it was kind of weird that i would be uh respectful to the porter mm -hmm. uh, but they weren't it wasn't they were unkind to him it's just that they didn't value him and because we had a relationship then it was something we'd give and we'd take and I, I I remember him so well because it's what my father taught me that whether you're the Prime Minister of India or you're the lady who is serving my food at my school lunchtime, and then I treat those two people with equal respect. Mm -hmm. That's just wonderful. That's just wonderful story. All right. What do you think the uh, importance of self-talk is primarily for kids and equally for adults? Yeah, I th I think it is important. I sometimes look at myself in the mirror and I'll say, um, I'll, I can say either in my mind or in my words, something like, you're all right, Bryn, keep going, you know, it's okay. This is hard or well done or what's the matter, my love? And, you know, I'm talk I'm having a conversation now. Anybody listen to this thinking I've gone a bit um, crazy? I haven't. I think that's what you mean when we, we're talking to ourselves saying, I'm I'm okay. And I, mm -hmm. and I think you do need to remind ourselves that, yes, I'm not, well, I mean, going back to that thing, it makes it sound like it's a big deal for me. It isn't now. But yes, I might be short. Yes, I might not be good at sports. But I have a lot of other things to give. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and so I, and I, and I, I think it is particularly at times when we're feeling, when we're feeling low, and, and I probably would use this as an opportunity to remind ourselves, it's all right to say to myself sometimes, you know what, today I'm just really anxious. I, I'm just really, I don't even particularly know why I'm nervous, but I know when I'm nervous, it means something. It means that I'm stressed about something. Just be kind to yourself. Maybe maybe go to bed a bit earlier or, you know, walk for further or something. But uh, again, it's just keeping an eye that having horrible feelings is normal. Mm, right. Right. Then in in these span of time, in these periods, how do you pep up yourself? So you say that, yes, it's OK to be anxious. It's OK to be annoyed. But then what are the things which you would do or what would be the self-talk at that point in time to get out of that annoying behavior or annoying mood? Well, the psychologist in me would immediately turn to a really important piece of evidence. And I don't know whether you're all familiar with this. I'm sure many of the children will be. So there's a bridge in San Francisco called the Golden Gate Bridge, which is enormous mm -hmm. and very high up. And one of the things is that it's been renowned for a place where people go to kill themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the study that was done of people who survived, the only thing that they regretted in their life was having jumped. Okay. And ultimately, we have I have days you have days every one of us will have days mm -hmm. and clearly one child an hour in india is having a day when this happens 
yeah. when it just feels hopeless, when it feels, what's the point? What is the point? Mm -hmm. You know, as I'm speaking to you today, the Middle East is nearly on fire again. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a tragic. What is the point? Um, and I, I think that the reason I mentioned the Golden Gate Bridge is because it's about having ways in which we can self-soothe to get through those difficult days because they will pass. Mm -hmm. And not not feeling shame or it's really hard, particularly I think for men, and I suspect for a lot of young men in India this is true, to be able to reach out and say, I'm really pet scared or I can't see the point. I'm never going to be successful like those people driving Ferraris in New Delhi. It's never going to happen to me. How can I ever cope with it? And the sense of overwhelming despair, those feelings are there in all of us and they're very normal. It's about knowing that, that they will pass and that you can find value and that value isn't in having a red car built by somebody called Mr. Ferrari. It's, it's in being able to wake up in the morning and know that you have respect for yourself and that you are, you are living and breathing today. And I know that's such a difficult message to give a 15 year old boy who in New Delhi is probably dreaming about that car today. Sure, dream about it, but it's not what defines you. It's not what defines you. And don't don't let the big footballers and the big movie makers pretend otherwise. It's not it's not that it's a it's, it's about having that integrity inside you that matters. Mm -hmm. So do share that you're scared of harming yourself. Do do share do share do tell people and find ways as teachers and find ways as organisations and faith bases and and any forms of support you can using charities or government to find ways of saying to people look when you're feeling that low just come here and let's just talk mm -hmm. yeah right right what do you see um, media has got a kind of impact on our psychology and i'm primarily talking about the part when they are manipulating us when they know that this is something which is going to convince us to buy something and then in that race they're actually introducing things the patterns which are harmful for kids is there anything like that well, I mean, actually, it's not a subject as a psychologist I know an awful lot about, but but yes, definitely uh, a combination of psychology, but also marketing. I, I, I think it's quite funny because um, I know in quite a lot of American films, uh, if it's been sponsored by Apple, all of a sudden everybody's got an Apple phone or an Apple computer will come up or or a Jeep will appear with a Jeep's name, you know. And I find it really irritating because then all I can do is look, I, I start spotting the, the Apple logo and I mm -hmm. can't watch the film. So mm -hmm. it's a bit lost on me. Um, but no, it is definitely there. Product placement is a huge part of marketing. And, um, you know, it's about, it's, it's it, it, you know, if, for us culturally, uh, like like I will see in, in the Indian movie, thing the, the the man with the right hair and the the right clothes and you know the beautiful woman and the beautiful woman with long hair and beautiful clothes i mean your your movie stars in indian films they're they're like royalty they're like the kings and queens that used to be in india two or three hundred years ago they're the new mm -hmm. moguls you're right right no. and and people almost worship them mm -hmm. um, and and they want to aspire to be like them and we have dreadful programs like Love Island and Get Me Out of Here and, uh, you know, the most awful things where people fire, fly through their lives looking for celebrity. Mm, yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, it's, it's yeah, I'm, I'm kind of ranting a bit, but I, I, the whole idea of celebrity, I guess you have it in India, but just to be famous for being famous sake, that's great if you're famous and you want to be, but it, it, it's a terrible pressure for us all to be famous. Right, absolutely. I, mean, I, I, I don't want to be famous. <laughs> right. Yeah. They go through a lot of pressure. They have, got their of pressure. Yeah. they have got own self-doubts. They, it, I mean, in, internally, they all are same, just like us. It's just that their job is something different, which brings uh, celebrity and that, uh, that uh, publicity to them. But otherwise, they are also very normal. However, they are there because of their hard work and because of the hours and hours of time which they have spent just to ensure that what they are doing, they're doing it close to perfect. That's how people oh, yeah. want to see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean, and people who do 
act in these films. I mean, they work so hard mm -hmm, and have indeed. accomplished so well. Um, I, I, I recognise every bit of that and the people that produce them and all the rest of it. What, what I just want us to be careful of is that if you're if you think that young people in India are chasing a kind of a social media dream and that that's the most important, it's at least giving the message, you know what, it's all right if you don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't right. mean you're any less of a person. I completely agree with you because in childhood, everybody wants to be either the actress or the actor in movies. This is absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. All right. yeah. What do you see this coming age as a robotic age? When we say 2030, primarily everything will be robotic. Everything will be automated. I mean, just see that you are sitting in London and I'm sitting in Delhi mm -hmm. and we are talking to each other. It is because of technology, which has got good um, impact on the society. However... This is equally true that we are advancing in that area where robots and more and more things would be mechanic. So yes. my question here is that considering that 90 we are operating through our subconscious minds, we humans are becoming more and more robotic. And these robots are becoming more and more human by understanding AI, artificial intelligence, which is coming, which is making them more and more humans. How do you see this new transformation? Um, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I, I don't have, as a psychologist, expertise in this whole field. I, I think the answer is we, do, we probably don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, the, one, the one thing about it that I am very interested in, and it's happening over in Europe a lot, is that there's a, um, I don't know whether you know of the car called the Mini. It's a, mm -hmm. They must have them in India, yeah. yeah no. So they built them near where I live. Mm -hmm. And when I was a child, the factory where they built them, if you drove past the factory at the end of the shift, there were thousands of people. Mm -hmm. And now when you drive past the factory, there are a handful of people. Uh -huh. Because inside, and you can see it on YouTube, you can see it, it's all been built by robots, just like uh -huh. it's all become automated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one of, one of the things that I think is a real challenge for us as human beings is that when the world becomes more automated, and yes, it's fun to be able to talk with your friend in Karachi or whatever, you know, whatever, um, that, that, um, that, that, that that's, that's the social media part of it. But the actual reality is that, that modernization and technology is going to mean that we don't have to do so many menial tasks. Mm -hmm. like, for example, there are robots that can do your washing up. We have dishwashers mm -hmm. and things already. Mm -hmm. You know, so it means that actually, what are we going to do with our time? Right. Right. What are we, what are we, what are we going to do? And actually being able to, I mean, some people have written about the philosophy of this and, and how it, to model it. But we might, we might get to the point in, you know, several hundred years time where we don't have to do anything mm -hmm. to live. Mm -hmm. You know, our clothes will be ironed for us, our, our houses will be clean for us, our shopping will be done for us. Uh, I mean, I'd never go shopping now. I just push a button on my computer and somebody mm -hmm. brings it to my front door. I mean, that's insane mm -hmm. but, you know, how that's changed, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think the big challenge for young people in the future will be, what are you going to do with your time? Mm -hmm. Right. And therefore being more than just clicking on likes or looking at the latest film getting pleasure and fulfillment and feeling whole i i do i do i do worry i do worry that you, you know my, my my grandfather used to say something really interesting we need another war and i used to think what a dreadful thing to say and he said because it gave people a purpose ah uh. and i said grandfather you can't say that it was a dreadful thing and he mm -hmm. said but people had purpose and and they felt they were needed, and they felt they belonged, and they felt, uh, you know, that they, they, things weren't important. So it was no longer important whether you got an A or a B in maths. That didn't matter. The right. B is fine. The B is mm -hmm. fine. What what mattered was that you had food on the table and you could survive. Now, what happens when everything becomes automated and we don't need to worry about survival? Mm -hmm. right. But also the environment. The environment creates huge challenges for us. You know, when I came to India, I came on a great big smelly, smoky 747 with four big engines whirring across India, landing mm -hmm. in Delhi and all the pollution in India. And, you know, the same in London. That's got to go. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it's got to stop or something terrible is going to happen for us all. So young people have got other priorities. And sadly, I will be an old man by then um, mm-hmm. in some ways. And I, I won't be contributing, but it, it will be it'll be a real challenge for them to fill their time with meaningful things. Right, right. Mm. Human interaction, maybe. I'd like to I'd like to think so, but that's only it's only a personal thought. It may be other things. It, it may be that we become um, I mean, in our culture over here, one of the things that is a massive change to me is the whole idea of gender and sexuality has changed dramatically. Mm-hmm. We have a member of our parliament just this week saying that she's uh, pansexual because she believes that love is about loving the person and it doesn't matter what gender they are. Mm-hmm. But I see a lot of children in complete turmoil because they think they are a girl when they are a boy and they think they're a boy when they're a girl. Mm-hmm. And they're very, very lost and confused about it. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know whether some young people in India feel that, but it's that's a very lonely and scary place to be. Mm-hmm. And also in terms of sexuality, to be a gay or lesbian or bi- bisexual young person, that's not the kind of thing we were talking about in India 30 years ago, but we right. need to be talking about it now. Right. Yeah. And we need to accept ourselves the way we are. Yeah. And that's challenging for cultures and uh, our faiths. Um, you know, or, or, or it's very, very complicated. Mm-hmm. Uh, All right. Uh, yeah. Here is another, uh, probably the last question, uh, which is that more and more education is going towards digital platforms. So yes. uh, there are schools, pre-nursery schools, kindergarten schools, those who are teaching, put one circle over another on a iPad, not primarily. So what what do you see that when soon the assessments would be happening online and Kids don't like anymore to read the articles or to write with pen. They love to type or they love to type the messages on WhatsApp, but then not, they really don't uh, like to write or read. How do you see this when these two skills are diminishing and others also along with this? Because the digital transformation is happening. What impact it has got on child's brain or even adult's brain, how that is going to impact? this generation yeah that, that that is a very big subject and again I, I think from a scientific psychological point of view there's a lot that we don't know about the impact of those things from we don't know because we haven't done it and we haven't got the long the long the long-term evidence to show us what happens but I, I think the way I conceptualize it with my colleagues is that if we go back to what a human being needs to function with they need to be able to eat sleep to look after themselves, to go to the bathroom, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, They need to be able to talk. They need to be able to speak, to hear, and hear the words and make sense of them. They need to understand. They need to be able to express themselves. They need to be able to move their fingers, to manipulate their keyboards. They need to be able to walk and run and climb up the stairs or down the corridor or ride a bike to work or get on the train. So their motor skills have got to be there. Their sensory skills about coping with the light, the sounds, the tastes, the busyness. Mm-hmm. Um, the pressure, sitting in a chair, sitting in a, having a blanket on your legs. So all of those human characteristics um, in education, the point of education is to is to refine and to develop and to hone those skills. Now, for example, when you're doing a cognitive intelligence test um, in India or here would be the same. Um, one of the things that we now do is most of this is online. And um, so rather than holding a pen and and drawing a shape, uh, the child just touches the screen. So they mm-hmm. they mi- you miss out on seeing that. But mm-hmm. in another test, they've kept the bricks mm-hmm. because they what you want to see how somebody actually takes a two dimensional flat screen mm-hmm. and does something with bricks to be three dimensional. Mm-hmm. Now I think the challenge for technology this is a challenge for technology for me mm-hmm. is so long as you're replicating what we teach and what we mm-hmm. need to achieve as human beings. I probably think that the biggest anxiety that psychologists have is that the the lack of mobility and praxis that comes mm-hmm. with flat screens and televisions and computers mm-hmm. is that you're not getting the movement. Mm-hmm. So that the development of the integration between the cerebellum and the brain and how it coordinates. So your coordination, uh, you know, you might be very, very good at doing a, a computer game, 
Um, but does that translate to driving a car? I was fascinated watching one of my sons go from being brilliant on driving these computer games. He was amazing. When I put him behind a wheel of a car, he was like something had happened to his brain. He was jelly. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what I'm talking about. Are we able to... Uh, it, the challenge isn't for us to meet technology. The challenge is for technology to come and support human development. And, yeah. and that, that, that's where I think the challenge is. Um, so education using screens can be helpful, but not if it's ignoring a part of development and motor development. I, I see a lot of children who uh, who aren't stimulated through play have very low muscle tone. This is in the extreme forms of neglect. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not playing with toys and you're not playing with other people, you're not developing all of your motor skills, you're not you're not regulating your attention and in inhibiting your responses and your impulses. You can't do that all on a screen. You just can't do it. I mean, not at the moment, not the technology I've seen. Maybe with virtual, sometimes you see it on fancy programs where people are doing things virtually with things on their eyes. But I, I, I'm afraid I, as a psychologist, I don't have the expertise to tell you what, what that means. But uh, I'm just talking in the work I'm doing at the moment in my neuropsychology. All right. All right. That's just wonderful. All right, Dr. Brian. So towards the end, what would be the two advice which you want to give to the kids and to the youth? I think treat other people as you would want to be treated. So don't bully people or disrespect them for who they are and what they are. If they're short, that's fine. If you're tall, that's good or not. I know tall people are unhappy. So accept who you are and who other people are. And I think probably going back to my thing about resilience is that life is going to be tough and possibly tougher for you than it is going to be, than it would have been for me. You're going to have some really important challenges around the environment and economy. And India is a very different place 30 years ago and it'll be very different in 30 years time it'll be a world leader it already is in many ways so that that's going to be a real challenge to live in um and so there are going to be some horrible dark days and it, you know it's okay to feel frightened it's okay to be sad it's okay to feel angry so long as you don't hurt yourself or anybody else these are normal human feelings and teachers need to let children experience disappointment. And in fact, the challenge I've got for any child who does watch this video or you know, converses a bit with you about this, go and experience some disappointment and learn to tolerate it. That was a wonderful conversation, Dr. Brian. Um, so if our audience wants to see you or meet you or see your work, where can they find you? So you can share your Facebook address, you can share um, Spencer.education and where else can they find you? Yeah, well, Sp Spencer Education is our, our, um, our attempt to be digital. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to support, in first place, the teachers to understand and then know how to help young people. So that Spencer is a program for teachers to be able to do assessment and to find some good evidence-based ideas to, to help them in their job. And then at the moment, right now, we're developing the young person and the parent version of Spencer. So very soon, if people keep their eye on their interest on Spencer education, but Spencer is the thing to keep your eye on. Um, uh, Spencer will be able to do that for young people and adults alike. I'm very excited with AI and using children and young people's interest in media to access mental health and support through many of the things we've been talking about today, but to support that through Spencer. So that that's the main point. It, um, and if you're ever in Oxfordshire in England, come and say hi. <laughs> sure, indeed, indeed, we're gonna say hi. Yeah. And Thank you. God, so God willing, I should be able to come to India again one day too. Yes, yes. of course, India is a beautiful place despite yeah. the pollution and other stuff. And though it's it's pretty clean now. Yeah, good, good. Keep it that Thank way. you. Yeah. yeah, sure, definitely. Thank you so much, Dr. Brian Williams. Thank you. It's been lovely it talking to you. Same here, Dr. Brian William. Thank you so much for being an inspiring hero for our youth and inspiring them with your success stories and the advices from your life. Thank you so much for your time.